Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Air of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. I want to begin today by uh, sharing with you four um, unequivocal commands to you. Uh, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there are four explicit commands in the Word of God. There are certainly many more than that, but four I want to show you this morning, explicit commands that are um, directed to you uh, from God's Word. I want you to see these, and I want you to think about how you're doing and obeying these commands. Okay, so here's the first one up on the screen. Here's a command to you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Now, this command comes to us out of Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, where the Bible says to us that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I've told you before that the word filled there does not mean to be filled from bottom to top. That, that's not the idea. So you can't say, well, I'm like, a, I'm like a half full Christian this morning. I'm maybe a third way full of the Holy Spirit because it's not measured that way. It's not what it means. It's not a measurement. When it says be filled with the Holy Spirit, the word filled is a nautical term which carries the idea of, of, of wind filling a sail. So if you've ever been on a sailboat and the wind comes up and that sail kind of pops in the wind and billows out, and as soon as the wind fills the sail, the boat begins to move. That's the word. Here's the command. Be not filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit so that your life is driven by, moved by the Holy Spirit of God. That's a command to you if you know Jesus. How you doing with that? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Second command, I'm gonna put up on the screen for you. It also comes out of Ephesians. Here's a command, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now one of the best translations I can give you for the word grieve is this. It's literally what the word means, do not irritate the Holy Spirit. That's what it means. It's a relational kind of word. Don't frustrate him. Don't irritate him. Don't fight against him and resist him. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Third command I want you to see comes out of Ephesians chapter 6. They're going to put it on the screen. Pray in the Holy Spirit. So this is not just the idea that I'm supposed to be a person who prays every now and then, say the blessing over my meal and say, you know, kind of my nighttime prayers and, and maybe every now and then another prayer. This is the idea that there is a spiritual living dynamic to my prayer life, this ongoing conversation that I'm having with God, which is directed by, influenced by, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So sometimes I don't even know what to pray and the Holy Spirit prays for me. And uh, the Bible speaks of groanings which cannot be uttered, but the Spirit of God knows the will of God and he knows how to pray. That my prayer life is to be invigorated and directed by the Holy Spirit. Three commands so far. Uh, don't grieve the Spirit. Uh, pray in the Spirit and be filled with the Spirit. Here's the fourth, uh, fourth one. Walk in the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that we are to live a life which is motivated and directed by the Holy Spirit so that our life is a reflection of his life within us so that we don't push him to the margins of our life but rather we value what he values we step where he steps we set priorities that are priorities to him that our lives are lived in the strength and by the direction of the holy spirit of god do you get these four commands there are a lot more i could give you but let's just stop with those four he says be filled with the spirit don't grieve the spirit pray in the spirit and walk in the spirit so how are things going with you and the holy spirit with that said, those questions sort of resonating in our hearts, I want to welcome you into our third week of our summer-long teaching series that we're calling We Hold These Truths. And as most of you know, in these summer weeks together, we are immersing ourselves in the timeless doctrines of the church and clinging to, holding to, these truths that direct our lives. We began two weeks ago in week number one by talking about the doctrine of God. We learned what God is like and one of the things that we talked about in week number one is that God is, according to John 4, 24, God is a, do you remember? He's a spirit, right? He's a spirit. And because God is a spirit, he's invisible. And the fact that God is invisible means that he has no physical form that we could perceive with our eyes or touch with our hands. He's not like us. He is invisible. He's in heaven. He's distant and far away from us, unreachable and unattainable. Last weekend, we learned in the doctrine of Jesus Christ that God is incarnate. So make the connection. The invisible God has become incarnate, or the invisible God has become visible. The God who has no form or body took on a form or a body in the person of his son, Jesus Christ. So in Christ, the invisible God becomes visible or he comes near to us. Today, we come to week number three, and as you've already been able to understand, we're talking today about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. 
And in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, we're going to learn that the invisible God who has become incarnate in the person of Jesus, now in the person of the Holy Spirit has become intimate with us so that he's no longer distant and he's not just near. Now he has come as close as possible. He literally has come to dwell within us. This is what the Bible teaches us about the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Now, it's probably important at the beginning of our time together that I would spend just a few minutes talking to you about who the Holy Spirit is and making sure that we take some steps to demystify him uh, just a little bit. It's probably true that represented in our church today, there are many of us who are relatively, if not very, unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit. We may just kind of have a, uh, a very limited understanding of him. You might even have a suspicious view of him. Uh, if you're new to the faith, this might be the case where you're going, look, I don't know a lot about this Christian thing. I just trusted Jesus as my Savior, and I'm not really sure even what all that means yet. And, and so this Holy Spirit deal is kind of new to me. So you may be clueless, and that's okay. Welcome, welcome into this Christian faith. We're going to help you with it, all right? It could even be that you've been saved for a really long time, but it might be that you grew up in or your exposure in church has been in a very uh, mainline denominational sort of world. So maybe you've been in church for years and you've just never heard a whole lot about the Holy Spirit and there's never been much teaching that's happened in your life about that. And so I wanna make sure that we get this right, okay? Uh, one of the problems is that uh, when you study what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit, we sometimes have a mystical sort of view of him because of mystical terminology that the Bible uses. Now, you know that I love and treasure and preach from and read the King James translation of the Bible. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful translation. One of the things the King James Bible does, though, and if you grew up cutting your teeth on this version of this translation of Scripture, uh, and if you're my age and you grew up in church, you, you did probably, um, is that about a hundred times in the King James translation, the word pneuma is not translated spirit, it's translated ghost. So if you read a King James translation of the Bible, far more times than you'll see the phrase Holy Spirit, you'll see the phrase Holy Ghost. And there's just something about that sometimes that causes us to go like, so the Holy Ghost thing is like this ghost, kind of like we envision him like Casper, the friendly ghost. We're like, I don't know if I want to even really know about the kind of ghostly deal in this Christian walk. So it's a little bit mysterious or mystic to us. Another problem, and, and I don't mean in any way to, um, to criticize our brothers and sisters in more charismatic or Pentecostal kind of traditions, but I think all of us would agree, as happens very often in any sort of tradition, we can have you know, overemphases on various things or abuses of various of, of things, that very often in the charismatic movement, there have been abuses and things that have been attributed to the Holy Spirit, which have nothing to do with the Holy Spirit at all. And sometimes those things have been very chaotic, um, very disorderly, even bizarre and yet they have been celebrated as being the work of the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes the rest of us kind of push away and go, you know, if that's kind of what the Holy Spirit does, that's a little weird. And I'm not even sure I want to be around that a whole lot, okay? I mean, that really is a problem sometimes. So, so maybe for that reason, you've kind of stayed away from this idea of the Holy Spirit. Maybe, maybe there are a lot of other reasons. But I want to make sure that wherever we are in our understanding of him, that we, be, that we walk away today with a good understanding. And so that begins with a good definition. So you're a note taker, most of you are. I want you to write down a definition. Just get this thing on paper, and then we'll talk about it. Okay, so here's the definition of the Holy Spirit, all right? The Holy Spirit is divine. Let's establish that in the beginning. The Holy Spirit is God. Or he's, he's, he is uh, divine. He is the third person of the Trinity, and he is currently at work in the world through his church as he indwells every Christ follower. Now, they're going to leave that on the screen for a minute because it's lengthy and I want you to get it written down. But understand that the Holy Spirit is God. He is divine. The third person of the Trinity currently at work in the world, active in the world, but he's active through his church as he indwells every believer. Now, what that says to us is that the Holy Spirit is not a force 
If you're like me, you might have grown up on a steady diet of Star Wars theology, did you? And if you remember in Star Wars, the good guys, the, the Luke Skywalkers, the Jedi, they needed to connect with the Force. They needed to feel the Force. And if the Force could somehow empower them, then they could, you know, work miracles and overcome Darth Vader and all the, all the bad guys, all right? Hear me say this. Nothing could be further from the Holy Spirit than that. Do you understand? The Holy Spirit is not a force. Write it down this way. He's a fellowship. He is the fellowship of God with us. One of the things that I would recommend for your future reading is John chapters 14, 15, and 16, where Jesus basically gives a dissertation on the role of the Holy Spirit in his church, and he says in that passage that he is God in, not only with us, but God in us. So the Holy Spirit is not a force. He is a fellowship. Secondly, I would say to you that the Holy Spirit is not simply a power, although he's powerful. He is a person. The Bible speaks to us over and over again about the personality of the Holy Spirit. And the third thing I would say to you is that the Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he. So I want to challenge you in your thinking from now on to resist the temptation to speak of the, of the Holy Spirit in this unanimated sort of way, calling him an it. I think there's a reason we do this, by the way. Did you do this when, you're, when, when you were having babies or when your wife uh, was having a baby? Did you talk about the unborn child as an it? Because we do that, right? Before we hold the child, it's an it. Now, not so much today because of 3D imagery and ultrasounds. I mean, you can kind of meet the child before it's even born now. But years ago, it wasn't that way. And years ago, you didn't even know if it was going to be a boy or a girl. And so it was always it. Well, I hope it's healthy and I hope it's, you know, this or I hope it's that. And then the moment that the baby is born, I mean, 10 seconds in your arms and he or she is no longer an it, right? You don't say, isn't it cute? You say, isn't she beautiful? Well, what happened? What happened was it went from a, a concept that you couldn't see or hold, that you didn't really understand, to your child. And I think this is the reason we refer to the Holy Spirit as an it. Because for so many of us, the Holy Spirit is this concept, this power, this force that we don't really understand. We don't have a relationship really with him. And so when we begin to grow in that relationship with him, then we will no longer refer to him as an it. So I challenge you, watch your, your, the way that you speak about him. Don't call him an it, all right? So you have your Bibles open to 1 John chapter number four, and we're gonna refer to several passages, but I wanna show you just two verses to begin with. 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse number 12. You follow along as I read. Verse 12 says, No man has seen God at any time. Now, pop quiz. Why has no person seen God at any time? It is because God is a, say it, spirit, right? God is invisible. That's why no man has ever seen him. You have not seen God. You may have seen something you thought was God, but you haven't seen God. No man has ever seen God at any time. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us and his love is being perfected in us. If I were to read that again, I might read it this way. No man has seen God at any time. However, if we love God or love one another, God dwells in us and his love is being perfected in us. Hereby know we, hereby we know that we dwell in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. A few minutes ago, we defined the Holy Spirit by saying that he is divine, the third person of the Trinity, and that he is at work in the world. I want to help you understand the Holy Spirit today by considering his Work. What is the work that he does? You can understand a lot about a person by knowing their work. If you watch somebody work, if you see what they invest their lives in, what they're good at, what they're passionate about, how they spend their days, that'll tell you a lot about a person. And so I want to apply that principle today to the Holy Spirit and learn about his, uh, him by learning about his work. So two things we're going to learn. First of all, write it down. Let's begin by talking about the converting work of the Holy Spirit. Would you jot that down somewhere, please, note takers? The converting work of the Holy Spirit. 
And while you're jotting that down, if you'll take your pen also and underline this statement in verse number 12, God dwells in us. God dwells in us. Now, the Greek word that's translated dwells there is the word meno, and it means to abide with or to reside with or to be in fellowship with. He dwells within us. Would you agree with me that some people are Christians and other people are not? That's a given, right? So some people are Christians, other people are Jews. Some people are Christians, other people are Muslims. Some people are Hindu. Some people are pagan. Some people are nothing at all. Some people are Christian, other people aren't. We all understand that. Would you also agree with me that some people claim to be Christian, but they're not really? Would you agree with that? There's some people who profess Christianity, but the truth is they're not really a Christian. Because the fact is, nobody is born a Christian. Nobody is. Everyone must be converted to Christianity. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be something else, like you have to be a Jew and convert, you have to be a Muslim and convert. No, what it means is you have to convert really from being a child of hell, a child of Satan, the Bible calls us, and to become a child of God. Everybody must be converted in order to become a Christian. Now, this is not Jimmy theology. This is Jesus theology. Look at John chapter 3, verse number 3. Jesus himself said, except a man be born again, converted, changed. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 7. It says the same thing. Emphatically, Jesus says, you must be born again. So no one is born a Christian. Everyone must be converted born again to be a Christian. So what then is the evidence that you have been converted? Just because you say you're converted, does that mean you are? Does converge, is conversion, is being born again, is that um, being baptized? Am I converted simply because I'm baptized? Well, no. I mean, you can be baptized a hundred times in 10 different ways and never be converted. Am I converted simply because I prayed a prayer somewhere sometime? Does that convert me uh, automatically? Well, not necessarily, no. Uh, am I converted just because I went through confirmation or catechism, joined the church? No. So what is the evidence that genuine conversion has happened? Look at it, verse 12, I had you underline it. Here it is. It is the only valid, listen carefully, the only valid authentication of a genuine conversion. Verse 12, God dwells within us. That's it. If God dwells within you, that and that alone is the authentication that you have genuinely been born Again, this is what he says in verse number 13. Hereby we know that we dwell in him and he dwell in us, dwells in us because he has given us of his spirit. So conversion is authenticated by the fact that God dwells within me. And God dwells within me, verse 13 says, in the person of his Holy Spirit. So my question to you today is this. If we're thinking about the Holy Spirit, does the Holy Spirit of God dwell within you? Have you truly been converted and do you know so because God dwells within you in the person of his Holy Spirit? So I want to talk for a few minutes about how that happens and how we can know if in fact it has happened. So let's begin by talking about the converting work of the Holy Spirit. What does that look like? Now, y'all are looking at me very thoughtfully this morning and they tell me sheep are eating good when they're good and quiet. So if you're, if you're feeding, would you say amen? amen? All right. So let's talk about this converting work. What does the Holy Spirit do in converting us to genuine faith? Write it down. Number one, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our need. That's where the work begins. He convicts us of our need for salvation. A moment ago, I mentioned to you John chapters 14, 15, and 16. And in those chapters, Jesus, on the night of his arrest, talks about who the Holy Spirit is and how he's going to come and what he's going to do when he gets here. And one of the things that Jesus says in that passage, I think it's in chapter 16, verse 8, Jesus says that when the Holy Spirit comes, he would do these three things. He would convict the world of sin, that he would convince the world of righteousness, and that he would convict the world regarding judgment which is to come. 
So what Jesus says is that the role of the Holy Spirit is to cause us to know that we are sinners. And then to cause us to understand that we are less than what God requires, which is perfect righteousness, and to understand that judgment will then come upon us because we are sinners. Now, this conviction that the Holy Spirit brings causes us, it leads us to repentance and to faith in Christ. So there's both a negative and a positive aspect to this conviction. The negative aspect is, it's conviction that I'm a sinner. The positive aspect is, it's a convincing that Christ is the Savior, the ability to trust in Christ to be my Savior. I have to tell you, I remember so well when this happened for me. And I remember it well because, you know, my story is that I didn't grow up in church. I, I, I didn't have a lot of spiritual development along the way. And so, and so there came this night when I was a teenager when I, I had suddenly this exposure to the gospel and I went into that service totally careless about sin, didn't care about God, didn't care about righteousness, wasn't interested about uh, in any of those things. But in that service, the Holy Spirit convicted me of my sin. So suddenly I felt this deep regret, this deep sense of guilt that I had offended God. I'd never felt that before. Why did I feel it that night? Because the Holy Spirit convicted me of it. Suddenly that night I believed the gospel that Jesus died and rose again to be my savior. I'd never even considered it prior to that night. Why did I believe it that night? Because the Holy Spirit convinced me of it. He convicted me of my need. Oswald Chambers said, you may not know his name, but you know one of his devotionals, the classic devotional guide, my utmost for his highest. Oswald Chambers said that conviction is God rousing the conscience rousing our conscience and that when he does that, he brings us to the threshold of understanding God. Do you see that the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, the converting work of the Holy Spirit begins with his rousing within us this deep understanding of our need for salvation, that we need a savior. So the convicting work of the Holy Spirit brings us to faith. Now, the second thing then that I want you to understand is that in converting us, the Holy Spirit not only convicts us of our need, but secondly, the Holy Spirit cleanses us from our sin. The Holy Spirit cleanses us from our sin. I think you would agree that our lives need to be cleaned up, right? I mean, because we're sinners and we're dirty and, we, and there's, there's stain and, and filth in our lives. And before the next thing that we're going to talk about can happen, the Holy Spirit has to do the work of cleaning our lives up. You can't clean your own life. Only the Holy Spirit can clean your life. Listen to Titus chapter 3, verse number 5, where the Bible says, He saved us according to his mercy by the washing, there's the word, the cleaning, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. At the moment of our conversion, it is the Holy Spirit that cleanses us and makes us a fit dwelling for God to dwell within us. The Bible says he baptizes us into the body of Christ and he cleanses our lives. Would you agree with me that if God is going to dwell within you, there needs to be some house cleaning done before he comes, amen? Because he's high and holy and perfect and sinless. And if the high and holy and perfect and sinless God is going to come dwell in this life, this dirty life, he's got to clean me up before he comes. Now, all of, all of our years that we've been married and going on vacation together, my wife has been very, very attuned to the fact that when you go into a motel room or a, or a cabin or somewhere where you're going to spend a few days, you don't know who's been there before you, and you're not really quite sure how that thing got cleaned before you got there. So she is very scrupulous about making sure that everything is disinfected before we can safely dwell in that place. It's like you walk in the door and she goes, wait, don't touch anything and for the next hour she goes through with disinfectant wipes and she's wiping everything down cleaning it up and then it's like she says okay now you can touch things and you can sit on the couch because it's all clean 
Do you understand that your life would never be able to receive the indwelling presence of God if it weren't for the Holy Spirit of God who came into your life at the moment of your conversion, cleaned your life up, justified you and made you just as though you had never sinned so that God himself who could no longer be far away, no longer just incarnate, but he could be intimate, he could come and dwell within you, but only because he cleanses you. If you understand, say amen. This is what he does, you see. It's what he does in converting you to Christ. He convicts you of your need, then he cleanses you as you put your faith in Christ. And here's the third thing that he does. And that is that he comes to dwell or comes to live within us. That this God who is unknowable, this God who is invisible, this God who we learned is far away and unapproachable and unrepresentable, has no form or body that we could ever see or understand, has become incarnate in the person of his son, but not just 2,000 years ago in history. Now he has come even closer. He has come literally to dwell within us. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God, God in you, he dwells within your body. Romans 8 verse 9 says the Spirit of God dwells in you. And if he doesn't, if he doesn't, then you don't belong to him. That's exactly what Romans 8 9 says. If he does not dwell within you, then you do not belong to him. So let me show you the progression. The Holy Spirit converts sinners into Christians as he cleanses us from our sins through the work of Christ, and then he comes to dwell within us. All right, so let's apply it. Let me ask you a question. Don't answer out loud, but think about it. Are you genuinely converted? Don't tell me that you are because you prayed a prayer when you were 12. Don't affirm, yes, I know I'm going to heaven because I was baptized when I was 15. No, no. What is the authentication that you are genuinely converted? Can you say, I know that I am born again, I am converted because I know that right now, today, there is an active presence of the Holy Spirit of God. God dwells within me and I know it. And that's how I know that I'm saved. You see, this is what 1 John chapter 4, verse 12 says, God dwells within us and that is the proof of our conversion. This is the converting work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the second thing and the final thing that I want you to to write down in terms of our our main understanding is that there is not just a converting work of the Holy Spirit. Write it down. There is a continuing work of the Holy Spirit. So I'll use myself as the illustration. When I came to faith in Jesus at the age of 16, that that was 34 years ago. I'm 50 now. So 34 years ago, there was an instantaneous work where the Holy Spirit of God convicted me convinced me that Christ was the Savior. I trusted Christ. He baptized me in the body of Christ supernaturally, cleansed me, and in that instant, God came to dwell within me. It all happened in a moment when I was converted. That was a one-time deal that happened April 29th, 1981, all right? But that was 34 years ago, so what's he been doing since then? Well, over the last 34 years, there's been an ongoing, continuing work where the Holy Spirit is shaping our lives to be like Jesus. We call this sanctification. It's a progressive, ongoing kind of work. First John chapter number four, you'll see this in this passage. He says in verse number 12, no man has seen God at any time. However, if we love one another, we can know, even though we haven't seen him, we can know that he dwells within us. And we can know that his love is being perfected. Within us. Now, the word perfected means matured or brought to completion. His work is ongoing or it's continuing to be matured or developed within our lives. Now, the context in which Paul says this comes out of verse, beginning in verse number nine, one of the most treasured passages to me and probably to many of you as well, begins in verse number nine. Look at it, 1 John 4 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. How do I know that God loves me? Because God said I love you? No, that's not how I know. God sent me a Hallmark card? Is that how I know? No. How do I know God loves me? I know he loves me because he sent his son into the world that I might live through him. Here in his love, verse 10. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. What a wonderful, wonderful verse. What a wonderful word, this word propitiation. 
It's a word which means the atoning sacrifice, or another way to say it is the covering. Let me show this to you. Hey, if y'all are listening, say amen. Don't miss this, watch this. Here am I, a sinner guilty before God. Here is the wrath of a holy God. John chapter three, Jesus himself said that if we know not Christ, we abide under the wrath of God. And like a guillotine of holy, righteous wrath, it is coming to execute judgment upon us. Rightly so, not because God is an ogre, not because God is unfair, not because God is mean, but because God is holy and righteous and we have rebelled against him. And here I stand deserving this wrath of God that would annihilate me forever. And there's no stopping it. It's not like God, give, oh, okay, we'll call it off, forget it. No, no, he would cease to be God if he did so. He must deal with sin. So he, he, his wrath is coming, but here's how I know he loves me. That in the final moment, just before that wrath came and took me to hell forever, Christ came, God in the flesh, stepped in front of me and took the wrath of God, covering me, and he took the wrath of God. He says, this is love, that God would do that for me. Look at the next verse, verse 11. Beloved. If God so loved us, we ought to love one another. One another. If God loved us that way, then we ought to love others similarly. What he says to us in this passage is that God has demonstrated his love for us, and when we love others in the way that God has loved us, it is evidence, verse 12, of the fact that God dwells within us and that his work is continuing. What this passage is teaching us is that the Holy Spirit abides within us to shape our lives into the likeness of Jesus. Now, I want to end my time with you by telling you what that continuing work looks like. Okay, Three words I want to give you, and we're going home. All right, so here's the first one. Write down the word fellowship. The word fellowship. This, this is uh, verse number 12. God dwells within us. When verse 12 says that we know we haven't seen him, but if we love one another, we, we, we know that he's there. He dwells with us, and it's evident through our love. He says he dwells with us. The Greek word I told you a moment ago is meno. It means to abide with. Well, I want to show you another place where John, different book, used the same word. Go to the Gospel of John real quickly. Turn to John chapter 15. Many of you are familiar with the passage. John chapter number 15 on the night of Jesus' arrest, he takes his disciples just hours before he's arrested. He'll be crucified in the next morning. He takes his disciples into the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, the Garden of Gethsemane is at the foot of the Mount of Olives. It's not a rose garden or a tomato garden. It is an olive garden. It's an, olive, it's an orchard of olive trees. I've been there many times. Many of you have been there with us. And so you've seen these olive trees. And they, they don't grow real tall. For the most part, they grow six, eight, maybe feet tall. You can easily reach up, and, and then they, they spread out wide. You can easily reach up and pull down a branch. And what Jesus did was he took his disciples into that garden, and he used those olive trees as an illustration of how the Holy Spirit was going to make them to be like him. So here's what he said. John chapter 15, verse number 1. Look at it. He says in verse number 1, I am the true vine, or I'm the tree, and my father is the husbandman or the gardener. Every branch in me that bears not fruit he takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he purges or cleanses so that it may bear more fruit. Now, you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. That's a command. You listening? It is a command from Jesus to you. The word that Jesus, or that, John, that Jesus uses and John quoted in this verse, abide, is the exact same word translated dwells in 1 John 4, 12. It, it's mino. It means to remain with or to ab abide in or to have fellowship with. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the true vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What Jesus says is, look, guys, and, and again, this is right in the middle of that dissertation on the Holy Spirit. Where Jesus says to them, I'm going to send. The Holy Spirit is going to come. I'm going away. The Holy Spirit is going to come and indwell you. He's, I'm going to abide in you. And now here's my command to you. Abide in me. So let me ask you a question. How's it going with you as a Christ follower abiding in Christ? Now abide, mino, means to 
to rest in. It means to remain with. How you doing? Let me give you two words that will help you know how to, how to abide. Okay, so here's the first one. Surrender. Surrender. You want to abide in Christ? Surrender. Surrender means you throw up your hands. You surrender your life. You run up the white flag and you say, my life is not mine. See, here's the deal for some of us. And I love you and I need to tell you the truth. And, and, and you may know Christ as your Savior. But there are so many ways and so many days in which you have said to Jesus and to his indwelling Holy Spirit, shut up and get out of my way. You have. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm going to do what I want to do. And you're not going to influence me. And you're not going to direct me. And you're not going to control me. I'm going to do what I want to do. And you are not surrendering. And you are grieving him. And you're resisting him. And you're irritating him. And you're, and you're distressing him. And what needs to happen in your life and mine is that we need to say, Lord Jesus, I surrender to the God that lives within me. I'm simply the temple of God living in this body. Okay, number one, surrender. You still love me? Say amen. Okay, number one, surrender. Number two is that we need to cling to. You want to cling to Jesus. Cling to him. It doesn't, so, so this is the attitude. It's not that, okay, I'll surrender. <laughs> Don't want to, but I have to, so I will. No, no. If you want to abide in Christ, you cling to him. You say, hey, what I love is what Jesus loves. What I want is what Jesus wants. What, what I'm about is what Jesus is about. And if Jesus is honored and Jesus is pleased, then that's what I want. And you cling to him like that. And so by surrendering and clinging, now you're abiding in him. He's promised to abide in you. And that brings us to the second part of his ongoing work is that fellowship, abiding, dwelling, leads to fruit. Fellowship leads to fruit. This is exactly what John's talking about in 1 John 4 when he talks about love, one of the fruits of the Spirit. But in John chapter 15 and verse number 4, he says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can you except you abide in me. I, I can just see this. I mean, I can see Jesus walking in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane with his disciples and pulling down an olive branch and going, Hey, guys, look. There's just 11 of them, right? Jesus and, and the 11 remaining disciples. And so he pulls that thing down. He goes, look at this. Do you see this olive out here on the end of the branch? You know how that olive got there? It didn't just get there on its own. You know how it's there? It's only there because the branch is hooked to the tree. And there's a good gardener. And the nutrients are coming from the trunk through the branch. And the olive can show up. And guys, the branch is me. And my father is the gardener. And if you will abide in me, then fruit will show up in your life. You'll be like me. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, make a note, read it later, tells us that there are nine qualities of the Christian life that look like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, meekness, self-control. He says that's what the Spirit produces to make us like Jesus. Can I tell you, tell you something? I'm not by nature a deeply loving person. I'm not. I, I'm not by nature a gentle person. I'm not by nature a patient person. Ask my wife, she'll tell you. I'm not. But here's what the Bible says. Jesus says, hey, Jim, I want to make you like me. So I've sent my Holy Spirit who's going to be intimate. He's going to live within your life. And he will abide with you. And if you'll abide in him, then he will produce in you fruit like love and joy and peace in these things. And your life will then bring honor to me. Hey, guys, if you get it, say, under, uh, say amen. Okay. So fellowship produces fruit. Conversion brings the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. His work continues through fellowship to produce fruit. All right, there's one other thing and we're going to go home. It's the last word. And I, and I can't leave here without giving you this word, but it's the word service, okay? So what does this continuing work of the Holy Spirit look like in my life? It looks like service. In other words, it looks like a heart to serve others. Do you understand that the Holy Spirit dwells within you not simply for you? He dwells within you for the blessing and benefit of other people. Now, I, I'm going to, I'm just going to, I wish I had time to preach this whole deal, okay? But you got to hear me in, in, in like two minutes. The Bible says that when you meet Christ as your Savior, when you are genuinely converted, that the Holy Spirit puts spiritual gifts, divine enablements in your life that are there for one reason and one reason only, and it's for other people in the body of Christ to be built up and benefited and blessed and helped, and so they can grow, okay? And there are so many of us in, in, in the Christian church who think that Christianity is all about me. It's about God saving me so I don't have to go to hell. It's about God helping me so my life can be better. 
It's about God scratching my itch so that I don't have any discomfort. It's about God kind of being my celestial sugar daddy to make life better for me. And you need to understand that the evidence of conversion is the indwelling Holy Spirit. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to cause you to love and serve others. And if you live your Christian life, your life as a Christian, simply for yourself, then it is evidence of either the absence of the Holy Spirit in your life or the grieving of the Holy Spirit in your life. So follow the progression. Conversion is the work of the Holy Spirit where he cleanses a person who has been convicted of their sins and believing, being convinced that Christ is a Savior. They trust in Christ and the Holy Spirit cleanses them so that God can come and live within that person in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then continues his work, abiding with them, transforming them day by day by day, more and more into the likeness of Jesus Christ as they love and serve others. And this is the reason 1 John chapter 4 says in verse number 12, look, nobody's ever seen God, but if we love one another, it's like we've seen him. It's the evidence that he's there because we know that his love is being perfected within us. So there are three possible responses to what we've learned. Well, there might be more than that, but three at least legitimate. So one is you might respond this way by saying, so here's the deal, here's the truth. I say I'm saved. I say I'm converted. I mean, I've been hanging on to that baptism when I was 12 or that prayer I prayed when I was 8, and that's what I always tell people. But the truth is, I mean, the, the, the truth about my life is there is zero evidence of the life of God in me, none. All I've got is a prayer I prayed when I was 12. But there is, there is no transforming of my life going on at all. And if that's the case, then you just need to admit I'm lost and I need to get saved. Okay? Because the only authentication of conversion is not the prayer you prayed, the baptism you had, the words you said. It is the active, right now, real-time work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Okay? The other, another response might be that you would say, you know what, I am so far from what I should be and he's still working on me, but praise God, I know I'm converted and I see him at work. He is changing me and I need to surrender more and man, I'm struggling here and there, but man, God's at work. Praise God that I see his work in my life. And the third possible response is you might say, you know what, there was a time when the Holy Spirit was at work in me. There was a time when I was converted, <laughs> but man, I've been pushing him away for so long. I've been grieving him for so long. I've been resisting him for so long that it's like he is in the margin of my life and, and he's so, he is so grieved that there's no real present evidence right now. I know he's there, but I need to surrender to him and abide in him. So I don't know what your response needs to be, but I know that every person in this room ought to be able to respond in one of those three ways. Okay? And I hope you will.